Hey everyone, welcome. Thank you for choosing to spend your valuable time with us today. Today's webinar will cover world's first SP800-140BR1 FIPS 140-3 validated certificate number 4718, presented by the one and only Wolf SSL Senior Software Engineer, Caleb Himes. My name is Dean Beggs. I'll be moderating this webinar. All attendees will be in listen-only mode. If you have questions, please use the question and answer box. After the presentation, Caleb will answer any questions. As always, all of our webinars are recorded and made available on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to stay updated with the latest from Wolf SSL, follow us on our Twitter, connect with us, connect with us on LinkedIn, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to reach out to us via email at fax at wolfssl.com if you have any further questions. Before we dive into this technical presentation, I'd like to provide a brief overview of Wolf SSL. Today, Wolf SSL secures over 2 billion connections. We have more than 1,000 OEM customers and dozens of resellers. Wolf SSL con consists of over 50 dedicated employees, primarily engineers. This progress is, of course, supported by a strong partner, partner network that we are proud of. Since the beginning, our engineering team has developed several embedded security products including WolfCrypt with DO178 support, FIPS certification, and a FIPS ready offering, MQTT up to the version 5 specification, SSH version 2, TPM 2.0, a secure bootloader known as WolfBoot, <clears throat> Java wrappers and JSSE support and commercial support for curl, and our newest product offering, Wolf, Wolf HSM. These offerings are accompanied by thorough maintenance and support plans up to the 24 seven level. We also offer full service consulting. And now I'd like to turn it over to Caleb to talk about world's, world's first SP 800-140 BR1 FIPS 140-3 validated certificate number 4718. Thank you very much. Thanks Dean for the intro. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We're we're super excited. Uh, so we started this process a little over three years ago. We actually were doing our first 140-3 submission when our 140-2 cert still had several years of life left in it. And the goal was that we would never have a lapse between the two. Um, so we're super excited that we finally got our cert. Unfortunately, the lapse did happen, um, <laughs> but I'll cover that here in our presentation. Um, so here's our agenda for today. Um, you know, we're gonna <clears throat> be covering the positioning of our FIPS module versus alternatives to our module. Um, we're gonna be talking a little bit about what is SP800-140BR1? Why are we the world's first? How did we get it? Um, the benefits of using the WolfCrypt FIPS module, again, over the alternatives. We'll be talking about our openness cell engine and provider solutions that make it easy to pull our FIPS, our FIPS certified module in um, and use it with openness cell applications. Uh, we'll be covering our Java and JSSE and JCE providers. Uh, we'll be talking about how we're the only general purpose embedded commercial FIPS offering. And we'll be going over open source applications that we support today through our OpenSL compatibility layer, as opposed to, you know, using the OpenSL engine or provider. Um, <clears throat> so what is SP800-140BR1? Um, the CMVP, you know, we, like I said, we started this process over three years ago, and it used to take about a year to get a full FIPS certification done uh, from start to finish. Sometimes they would take about 15 months, a year and three months was not, you know, in the realm of impossibility. Um, but we submitted and we were three years down the road and we still weren't even in review or coordination. Um, so it had more, the time had more than doubled, almost tripled. Um, and so the CMVP finally admitted, you know, we just can't keep up. There's too many submissions coming through. We, 
huge backlog. We're trying to do both programs, 140-2 and 140-3 at the same time. We're just overwhelmed and we don't have enough staff to keep up. So we're gonna automate part of the submission process. And so they came up with a new special publication. That's the special publication 800-140-BR1 that outlines the automation process and how it will be accomplished and how it will reduce the review times and, and turnaround times on submissions. Um, because it was an unproven, untested solution, um, they invited a couple labs, a couple of the FIPS labs, to the program under a pilot to help them test this new thing out and see if it was even uh, viable. Those labs were each given one or two slots and they could invite a vendor of their choice. And we were um, lucky enough to be invited to that pilot program by our partners at Agesolve Incorporated. Um, special shout out to them. You know, they, they worked with us very closely on this. Um, they, they went out of their way uh, to make sure we were successful. Their reviews were immaculate. I can't say enough good things about them. Um, they also came up with a proprietary, what they call the AgeSolve vendor portal. And that's a tool that it makes it very easy. You just go in, fill out a, a text field, select radio buttons for all the options. And at the end of the day, it'll output a 140 BR1 compliant security policy, made the process very straightforward. All the JSON is handled on the back end, so we didn't even have to uh, mess with the JSON format ourselves as a vendor. We just had to fill in the information about our module. Um, and then finally, uh, oh, sorry, I, I didn't talk about the time. So we got that invite in Q2 of 2023 or sorry, the CMVP announced that in Q2 of 2023. And it was right at the tail end of Q2, start of Q3, 2023, that we got an invite. We started work in July. We did a full submission with a 140BR1 compliant security policy on October 2nd. Um, I think we had a total of four rounds of formatting commentary from the CMVP between October and receiving our cert, and we had one round of technical comments. Um, so after coordination and comments, uh, we finally received our 143 certificate on July 11th, 2024, so just last week. So that was awesome. Um, <clears throat> all right, so what are the benefits of using WolfCrypt FIPS versus very, you know, a bunch of companies take OpenSL forks and they go certify them. And then some of those companies offer, you know, rebranding, white labeling, OE additions to those certificates. Um, so what's different about Wolf SSL and what those other OpenSL forks are offering? Um, that's what this slide's covering. Uh, the biggest points to hammer home are just that, unfortunately, we had a five-year or sorry, not a five year, a five month lapse. But typically in the past, especially with FIPS, we've, we've never let a cert lapse. This was the first time it happened and it wasn't for a lack of us trying to avoid it. Uh, we were doing everything in our power to avoid it. Whereas we've seen OpenSL forks in the past that had certificates, it was coming up on end of life and they weren't even worried about it. People were asking them, are you gonna extend? Are you gonna resubmit? And they just said, eh, whatever. So we care a lot. Um, we uh, we lose sleep on behalf of our customers. We stay up late at night worrying about this stuff. Not all the open cell forks do. Um, with the 140-3 delays that we observed, we were very conscious of the fact it looked like a lapse was going to happen even a year before it did happen. And so we were already taking initiative, you know, a year in advance, trying to, to avoid that lapse um, through this pilot program. Um, our original submission, the three-year-old one that I've been referencing, that's still on hold. It's on the module and process list, but thankfully we were prepared for that by pursuing this pilot. Um, 
because we we kind of foresaw that happening. Um, <clears throat> the other a big differentiator, there's a implementation guidance directive in the old 140-2 standard, and that's the number this is referencing is from the 140-2 standard. It's IG 9.10. I don't have the reference for the new standard. Uh, there, it's going to have it in both standards. Um, it'll just be a different IG number. Um, but there's an ID that you know stipulates performing an automatic power on self test that's outside of user control. And to my knowledge, and the knowledge of the rest of our staff, uh, it doesn't appear that the OpenSL FIPS offering actually does this. Um, so we feel that's a differentiator between us and them. Um, and then finally, Wolf Estelle ensures optimal performance, sizing, and resource use in all environments. Um, we have a lot of really talented engineers here at Wolf SSL, and we're constantly reassessing, reviewing, you know, did the, did the latest changes and the latest release bloat our footprint? And if so, we'll do a special pass just to get our footprint back down. Um, did we impact performance? Are there things that negatively affected the performance? And if so, how do we address that while still keeping everything as tight and secure as possible? And then finally, resource use at runtime. Uh, we're often measuring the stack and heap use and just, you know, release to release. We don't want to be blowing that out significantly if it creeps up by a few bytes we're okay um, but if it you know if it suddenly is consuming 100 kilobytes of stack or allocating 500 kilobytes of heap more than it did two or three or four release cycles back we're going to take a hard look at that and get it back down um, and to my knowledge OpenSL again uh, doesn't do this and then those uh, companies that take OpenSSL and certify it and don't have technical resources, they're just not capable of, of making those kind of optimization passes and addressing issues like this, at least not to the level our team is capable of. Um, so then if we get into the alternatives, you know, OpenSL 3.x, we've heard a lot of reports about performance and sizing issues. Um, Customers will be fine with one, two, maybe even five TLS connections, but as soon as they hit 20, 30, 50, you know, just tens of connections, um, there's a very noticeable slowdown in the performance and throughput of TLS connections. And sometimes even just 100 connections will actually um, nearly exhaust all the resources or start causing um, failures on even high level server systems. Um, so if you're trying to service millions of connections, um, it quickly becomes problematic. I don't know if those have been addressed in the later OpenSL 3 releases, but those were reports that we were seeing um, throughout last year and early this year. Um, next is many of the 140-2 certs that certified OpenSL, they'll be expiring soon, and there's no near-term 143 replacements on the horizon that were seeing. Um, there's many on the MIP list, but a lot of them are still pending review. They haven't even started review or entered coordination yet. Um, they don't always offer engine or provider solutions. Um, they may not always pursue options for timely 143 certification. Like I said, we lose sleep over this stuff. Um, They'll just do one submission and, and they're happy to ride the course until they finally get it, regardless of the time taken. Um, and like we already covered, they don't always offer a power on self-test. Um, and then lastly, uh, we feel that a lot of the alternatives, not just OpenSSL, um, but a lot of the alternative implementations out there, they just suffer from poor design, old and bloated code, and and what some of our staff calls the dinosaur syndrome. You know, they're, they're legacy dinosaurs. All the original authors are gone. There's very little active, you know, attempts to optimize, reduce size, reduce runtime resources. They're just happy to keep plugging along. As long as the thing works, um, you know, that's good enough. And 
uh, at this point in our evolution anyways, we do not suffer any of those problems. We've also seen, you know, I mentioned hundreds of server connections, uh, or sorry, TLS connections on the server causing crashes with some versions of OpenSSL, especially the 3.x ones. Um, we've, we've had a few reports now from customers that they're able to achieve 10 times more connections on a server system um, just because using Wolf SSL, just because we design for embedded use cases and we do do these sizing and, and runtime resource measurements and everything else, um, a lot of our customers, even in the back end world, are seeing reduced costs in their cooling requirements, reduced costs in power because they can serve a million connections on a server box, no problem. They don't have to be running 10 server blades to service those 1 million connections. They can get away with just one server blade. So it's a lot less cooling, a lot less power use. Um, and then obviously that translates very well to embedded battery conscious devices as well. Um, and of course we do target deeply embedded. So we're capable of doing FIPS on Green Hills, VxWorks, real-time, RTOS, digital signal processors, you name it. We've done it or a system very similar to it. Um, we're in a lot of medical um, battery operated devices as well. And many of the alternatives just can't achieve that because they don't design for the deeply embedded. Um, and then lastly, uh, we've seen some, all, some reports about alternative solutions. When we're you know, pitching a bid on an upcoming project, we haven't won, we're in competition, a customer is assessing us and maybe multiple other FIPS offerings. <clears throat> um, we've had reports of things like some of our competition will offer to vendor a firm something that isn't even remotely similar to a tested configuration that's on their cert. It's like they'll, there will be maybe a tested configuration for Windows on Intel and they'll offer to vendor a firm that on an ARM system running free RTOS, for example. Um, and that's if the thing would even fit on there. Uh, so there's some, some questionable practices that do happen in the FIPS world and so we would just watch out for that. Um, we've also seen the term FIPS inside, not always, but occasionally the term FIPS inside will be used to reference software, which is viable or valid. You know, if you have a, a whole product and you've got a software module inside that, the term FIPS inside does make sense. But we've seen it abused in some cases um, where they'll use FIPS inside to get around having to certify an operating environment. But then in the end, when the customer that goes with that option, bids on a contract, the solution gets reviewed by the purchasing entity or the federal government, and then they end up losing the contract because it's, it's not um, what the federal customer needs to see um, to make that purchase. So just be aware of red flags um, and, and don't cut corners with FIPS. That's, that's the strong, strongest takeaway I can say. There's really no cutting corners with FIPS. You gotta do it right. Um, and then finally, or sorry, not finally, but <laughs> onto our next slide. Um, the benefits of using Wolf SSL versus the alternatives continued. Um, so we, our whole staff has a security first approach where uh, we care more about people doing things the right way in the secure way. We care far more about that than we do about you know just seeing something running and working. If it takes a little bit more effort to get it stood up in a proper way, we offer free pre-sales customer support to get you over those humps. Um, we do you know we verify the peer certificate on every connection. You have to tell our library to override the verification if it's failing if you want to skip it. Whereas a lot of the alternative solutions, they'll actually skip the verification check just so you can quickly see something running and working. Um, and then you have to explicitly tell them to, ver to do the verification steps later on down the line. Well, the problem with that is 
in the industry and in practice, what ends up happening is a lot of developers that aren't familiar with TLS or clients and server standups, they'll end up copying and pasting code and they'll end up carrying those bad practices of not verifying things into their end applications and they won't even be aware of it. Um, so our approach is always security first, the alternatives not necessarily and not always. Um, we suffer fewer vulnerabilities year over year than a lot of the leading alternatives. Um, and if we do have a vulnerability, we have a guaranteed reaction and response time of 72 hours or less. And we will get new releases out to affected vendors uh, within a week. Um, and the alternatives, they'll, you know, we've, we've seen some vulnerabilities that were well reported, well documented. The maker of the TLS stack or the cryptographic module was aware of it and they just decided not to address it for months, weeks, years. Um, they'll just let it ride until it becomes an issue. We address everything. Uh, that, that's our approach. For commercial support, um, we have, you can have direct access if you use our commercial support option to any of our engineers and even the original library author. Um, he's still here, still our CTO and helping run the business now. You can talk to any of us um, and we have a guaranteed four hour response time. We will assign dedicated engineers for certain projects, especially on consulting efforts and stuff like that. So you get to know the engineer you're working with, you have a relationship with them, you can call on them at any time. And we offer customizable support packages, 24 by seven premium standard and basic, depending on your project's needs and, and whatever fits best. Um, I pick quite a bit on resource and consumption, so I'll kind of skip over that bullet. Um, yeah, again, we just always optimize for resource and and consumption of resources at runtime. And for our performance, like I said, we have a lot of skilled engineers here and we're always doing everything we can to make sure we're taking advantage of every optimal um, solution we can on a given system. So like if it's an ARM V8 chip, we've got the latest and greatest ARM V8 acceleration. We've seen there's ARM 9 chips and there's gonna be the ARM V9 acceleration coming out, we're already aware of it and, and tracking that and prepared to implement it as soon as it's available for testing. Um, yeah, we and we target, you know, just about every chip out there. It's not just ARM V8. We do Intel acceleration, RISC V, um, the ARM V7 architectures. If it's got something that can help increase the performance, we'll take advantage of it. Um, so what are the engine and the provider? So in OpenSSL 1, um, they had what was called the engine. And in OpenSSL 3, they have the same concept, um, but it's called a provider. Um, and what it is, it allows you to plug in a third party cryptographic implementation. And then anytime the TLS, SSL or TLS stack needs to do a crypto operation, you can tell it, hey, don't use the OpenSSL crypto, use this third party crypto instead. And what's really nice about that is it is that any application on the entire system, so let's say it's Linux and there's OpenSSH on there, let's say there's Lighty on there and StrongSwan, three different um, apps that all consume OpenSSL and the OpenSSL cryptography. And let's say that open cell cryptography isn't FIP certified, but you need it to be. You can just grab our Wolf SSL engine, compile the binary, then tell the open SSL configure file where the binary is located. And now all those apps on the system start consuming the FIP certified cryptography underneath. So it's very easy to, to get up and running. Um, the only drawbacks to this approach is that you're still using the OpenSSL TLS code, um, which is bloated code, legacy code, consumes more resources at runtime. 
minus the cryptography that you're now consuming, um, um, you're still relying on that same TLS stack that suffers more critical vulnerabilities year over year than our own. Um, and then at times, you know, the vulnerabilities can be addressed quickly by OpenSL, but again, a lot of times we've seen them sit on them for weeks, days, months. Um, and then finally, OpenSL can actually fail to locate the third-party crypto if you edit the wrong configure file, or if there's a custom configure file for, say, OpenSSH that overrides the global default one. Um, it can fall back to using the non-FIP certified OpenSSL crypto, and you won't get a warning or an error or anything in the logs that will indicate that happened. By default, I believe you can configure it to report the warning or the error, um, but by default, it it can be difficult um, to detect when that happens. And then to actually prove that it's consuming the FIPS certified cryptography, the best way we found is just enable debugging in the Wolf Crypt library. That way, when you're running your OpenSL apps, you can see the Wolf SL or sorry Wolf Crypt messages printing out the debug messages. And then you're confident, okay, it is really consuming um, the FIPS certified crypto at that point. Um, as far as the Java and JSSE and JCE providers, so we offer a Java native interface wrapper that wraps a whole slew of our um, C APIs and makes them callable from a Java application. We also, within that JNI wrapper, have specific um, Java Secure Socket extension provider and a Java Crypto extension provider. And these are very similar to the OpenSL concept in that it's a clearly defined API set that allows you to plug in a third-party cryptographic solution underneath. And we're just implementing the right um, APIs to make that callable from the Java programs for the JSSC and the JCE um, specs. Um, I've, we've also included in the slide some helpful links if you want to look those up after. Um, but the main point of covering this is that we noticed there's several Java FIP certificates out there that are about to expire um, either in the next year or two. And we don't see 143 replacements for them or there are 143 replacements in process, but they're still pending review and haven't even gotten to review or coordination yet. So they're probably a long ways out at this point. Um, and like we had covered in the agenda at the beginning, we are the only embedded general purpose commercial FIPS offering that we are aware of. Um, and we've accomplished this by developing some in-house tooling that makes it possible for us to, to complete the CAVP algo testing on embedded devices. We can, we can get algo testing done on targets that have no file system using our in-house tools. Um, we can get CAVP done on devices with a file system, but where the file system is so limited, it wouldn't be able to load, for example, a SHA-2512 vector file, which uh, on average is eight megabytes, sometimes bigger, depending on how you um, set up your vector requests that go to the CMVP. And that's just the, the 512 one. There's also a SHA-2384 SHA that's just as big. Um, so a lot of our competition or a lot of the alternative vendor solutions, they'll they'll actually say a file system is a prerequisite. Oh, and by the way, it has to be able to load eight megabytes at least. So we can, at a minimum, put one file on a time and process it and get the results off. We don't have any of those restrictions. Um, and of course, you know, systems with desktop, server laptops with full capabilities, we can we can absolutely certify those, not a problem. Um, since day one, you know, we've always designed for deeply embedded. Um, that was kind of our niche in the market. And it just so happens that, like I've covered quite a bit in this presentation, that just translates really, really well onto back-end 
and server type systems as well. Um, I, sh I did also want to mention, you know, for the deeply embedded, we've seen a lot of need for secure bootloaders uh, with a FIPS requirement. Um, so not all the hardware bootloaders out there have been certified. Our bootloaders written in software, it can run in place of a hardware implementation. So even if you have a device with a bootloader, but it's not FIPS certified, you have a FIPS need, you can put our software bootloader on there to take the hardware's place. Um, and then, it, like I said, it's, it's portable. It can run on just about any embedded device with enough resources to support it's got to be able to support two firmware images at once. You've got um, a swap, a hot swap that has to happen. So you need room for the old image and the new image being updated. Um, but that's it. Um, yeah. So portable, FIPS certified, secure bootloader. And finally, we wanted to just list out. You know, these are all the open source projects that we've worked with to date to either um, use our OpenSL compatibility layer or uh, using the engine and the provider interfaces to OpenSL, um, make it so that it consumed WolfCrypt FIPS cryptography underneath. Um, this is just a list. I'll, I'll let you guys read the table. I believe we're going to send a copy of this slide deck out after the presentation upon request. Um, so if you want a copy, just let us know. Um, and, and that's what that bullet at the point is at the end there is for is if you read this table and you've got an open source project that you don't see in here and you'd like us to support it or at least test and, and see if it works, maybe help your team get up and running with it, just let us know. We're more than happy to add support for new projects. So that concludes the presentation. Are there any questions, uh, concerns, comments? Please let us know now. Thank and you, Caleb. Yep. Thanks, Steve. Um, we do have a question here. Um, it says I'm willing to test the Wolf SSL for a WPA3 encryption, but since the host is likely a less powerful router and the clients could be equipped with any hardware, is there any concerns regarding the resource consumption on both server and client side? No, no, I don't see any concerns there at all. All right, and I, I do I have a personal question. When, what, what, where, or when can we start doing OE additions? Um. Oh, good. Yeah. So we just talked to our FIPS lab on Friday of last week about starting that process. We did get the contracts going. Um. But they informed us that the web cryptic tool, which is now required for all submissions after January 1st of 2024, currently does not support OE additions, um, white labeling, rebranding. I think there's 12 total submission scenarios, and of the 12, it currently only supports full submissions, um, update submissions, um, an update is if you're familiar with the FIPS world, it's equivalent to what used to be called a three sub. Um, so it's basically you make a security relevant change to a module, you've got to undergo certification again, just like you did to get the cert initially, but it's a lightweight, what's called a revalidation effort. Um, it's a little lighter weight than a full submission. Anyways, oh, sorry, I'm getting long winded. And then the third submission scenario they support is called a V-up, which is just an update to the security policy, like a documentation update. So we're still waiting for them to add support for OE additions and uh, white labeling or rebranding, as some call it. Well, thanks for we're answering not... that. Yeah. yeah. Um, we got another question here. It says, uh, can you refresh on how pricing works with Wolf SSL? Um, I'm, so I'm an engineer. I'm not always tracking the latest on our pricing. Uh, my biggest recommendation would be, you know, talk to get or send us an email to FIPS at wolfssl.com and just ask for a quote. Um, you know, one of our business representatives will get you an up-to-date uh, pricing quote. Awesome. 
I think that'll wrap up the questions for today. Just want to thank you very much, Caleb, for hosting an informative webinar. Thanks everyone for joining today. I will email a copy of the webinar recording and PDF slides. You can keep up with our upcoming events, meet our team in person, read our blog posts, and get the latest Wolf, S Wolf SSL updates by following us on X, connecting with us on LinkedIn, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to shoot us an email at fax at wolfssl.com. That's fax at wolfssl.com. We're here to help. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you ne next week on July 24th for secure and reliable firmware updates with Wolf Boot. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Bye. Yep.